Okay, everybody, it's uh, Kevin Wadsworth and Patrick Crim, NorthStarBadCharts.com. It's great to have you with us today and uh, got a real treat for you here. We've got Francis Hunt, the Market Sniper, at Market Sniper on, uh, on Twitter and the MarketSniper.com on, uh, on the World Wide Web. Great to have you with us, uh, Francis. How are you doing? Kevin, thank you so much for inviting me back. Nice to meet you. See Patrick again. How are you guys keeping? Yeah, yeah, we're hanging in there. It's a uh, rock and roll on the on the Twitter Twitter universe, but uh, the charts they they keep us uh, sane. Charts are truth, Patrick, and I think personally, I don't know what's been going on in the Twitter world with you, but I think personally, you guys have been dropping some amazing charts recently. Uh, I, I, there's not very many people that, that do cross market analysis uh, at all and uh, certainly as creatively as you have been doing. Um, and I think you're getting to a lot of truth. Uh, so I'm not surprised you might be picking up some flack as well because people don't like truth near as much as they think they do. <laughs> but anyway. Yes, I 100% agreed there. I, I didn't know that word there. You call it cross-market. Then I heard some other guys say it's intra-market analysis. I didn't even know that word existed. We just looked at racial charts comparing these bigger asset classes. And then when we saw individual charts tracking those bigger racial charts but i didn't know there was a word so you call you call that cross market analysis yes in fact we go we go a little bit further and we've sort of created our own hype phrase but i think you're, you're playing in the same park to some degree uh we also go so far as to say 360 degree analysis which means uh instead of looking at fiat as the be the benchmark of anything we eliminate them entirely and we 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 like to see gold in oil barrels or smp and gold bars as as, as you've been doing uh, or silver ounces or etc cetera, etc cetera. in other words uh, it's almost like the barter economy is back uh, if you do full 360 degree analysis and it eliminates a lot of the noise and chop that currency introduces because current currency markets can be a little bit schizo and they're also a little bit news driven and recently we've actually had the dollar be a large part of the news as well so you had the, the dollar super strength that took us up to 114. And then you had the de-dollarization theme, which took us all the way back to one at once. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's actually handy to have, there used to be the stable coin alongside which everything else's volatility was measured. They're now looking a little jittery. And of course, with the debt markets being the sort of the dark side of the moon to the currency markets, the, as, as in our opinion, we crossed the Rubicon in March 2020 in terms of the macro trend on um, uh, debt markets, which are going to have a high volatility effect coming, I think, in 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 currencies um i don't know if you've got time for this but in your question we actually think when everybody is focused on a pivot um what you may get is a, is a pause or even one or two cuts possibly one cut possibly two but you're going to end up the next major move we think is actually potentially an interest rate spike and that's how you get uh, the likes of the dollar milkshake theory coming around uh, things don't die quietly. They don't always wither on the vine. I think everybody's thinking it's going to go like the pound quietly into the night. Um, it's, it, uh, I think you might get a different play out and you could have uh, a bit of spiker mentals. Uh, and that's this is th that weird thing that seems to be going on with farm production having to be right sized, which is a euphemism for downsized because of, you know, Irish cow farts are clearly killing the climate. Uh, and as a result, I'm seeing inflation remaining stubbornly strong and uh, and where they overshoot on the right sizing, it's potential scope for basic items, consumer items to actually go substantially up, which could lead to further interest rate spikes. Um, I have a reset sniper that actually sees who has an opinion, which will either be proven wrong or right, as to where they want to go. And um, the hollowing out of the middle classes in the Western area, uh, generally the Commonwealth, Europe uh, and North America's um, is where I think they want to go. And an interest rates, interest rates is the nanothermide of controlled demolition of your personal finances for most people, because many people have, most people have mortgages. Um, and even though some are fixed, there's weasel room possibly in banks, we're gonna see reneging. We could see very steep interest rates uh, actually cause a lot of the damage that I think they seek to cause. And I, I'm more in the intent rather than the incompetence camp. So yeah, that's maybe a bit more than you asked for, but that's kind of like a house view, a foundational uh, statement. Well. 
Okay, let, let's start with, uh, I know there's other subjects to cover, but let's start with the rates. Do you have a technical roadmap, some type of guidance? Because everybody wants to know where are these 10 years or what, like whatever yield you prefer. Can you show us like a chart and tell us like what kind of roadmap you're envisioning? Sure, 100%. Let's do that. Let's jump to the debt markets as a natural kickoff point. Um, let's start with uh, the 30 year. Um, I'm going to okay. request a share when? there and let's see if we can do that. Share screen. Kevin, cow farts, they're, they're causing climate change. We have to stop that. I don't even know where to, I don't even know where to go with that one, Patrick. But uh, well, I know in the suburbs in Quebec, when I, I drive through those uh, roads where there's farmlands and put up the put up the windows. Remember when we were kids, we didn't have AC in the car and we had to roll up the windows because the stench of the whatever, the methane, it was just horrible. Yeah, <laughs> broileries you, my, my and chickens. The same thing, so. <laughs> used used to do that. Not... The smell of the countryside. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so when you good. get used to it. <laughs> breathe it in, it's lovely. The farmers, it doesn't bother them. They, they once you like you, you live in that. It's like it's just natural, right? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, the big question in the debt markets, Patrick. Going back to your question, um, technicals. I've got the thirty-year yield here at the moment, uh, bond yield. The big question. Don't forget, we got this sell-off, and many people went into pivot mode. Uh, it was November, back end of last year. That's it. We're done with the hikes. We've got this extended period. We'd seen that already once before. So people have called uh, top uh, on rates a couple of times. However, we stubbornly clung on to this level over here. Uh, and this is the price action in essence that you've uh, got. And it's gone super low vol. And then it's been walking its way a little bit out. So they seem to have contained um, the trend for an extended period since November which is what it's going on for six months now. We almost mm -hmm. half at June will the end of June will be the full month. So six, maybe even seven months. Um, we did break a little technical level that's pointing to it actually bleeding more to the upside, which is one of the reasons why I think people could be a little bit shocked because most people, uh, the daily shock, for example, is expecting a pause on the next interest rates increase and it may well come, but I think everybody's going to call tops on rates too soon. Um, and we can't say that until we get such a violent demand destroying event that brings, and I'm going to sew in another market here, our energy market positions, which haven't fully come to fruition yet, a demand destroying event. We've had two OPEC uh, production cuts, uh, which and, and the oil's fallen from the 84s, 83s to around about 71. But I would expect your energy uh, shorts, particularly on oil, um, to start to get some love uh, to the downside if this rates do eventually break this uh, quadrupled up pink line that I've drawn uh, here. So if we reverse and we go back down, that will then be what I would describe as a demand destroying event. Then we're going to get a deeper pull on the rates. But even on a deeper pull on the rates, if we do this, um, it's not returning to whence it came in March uh, 22, uh, 2020, my apologies. And I think you will come down and then the, you will run these highs is our overall expectation. So you are in a bull market. I'm not on the biggest time frame here. And, you know, yes. both of us love the macro. So let's just get it a little bit further out to get some context in this. So that was the extent of the March uh, 2020 events right down at 0.7. You're in a bull market for yields, a bear market for bonds. And let's remember the previous market, the, the previous um, trend was a 40 year bull market for bonds and bear market for yields. Wow. Yeah. We've seen so, that one before, right, Kev? There's a, there's a, and yeah. there's a very, clear, very clear breakout there. So you've had a 40 year trend, which we broke out of. And when that. Um, when, when you break out of such a multi-decade trend, it's, it's, it's sending a signal to the market, well, which needs, yes. you need to listen to that. Well, I think this is the great unspoken about story, actually, guys. Uh, I mean, you're technicians. Everybody knows the dot-com melt-up, uh, and that's the beginning of the end. In the similar way, you get capitulation, final capitulations on um, these bear markets, which is a yield. You had the dot com, uh, so we're looking at essentially the upside down version of the values of bonds when you're looking at the yields like this. And this was a huge broadening structure.
but it was a sustained tr mm. trend that was getting ever more volatile. This is log scale for everybody's benefit, just so that they know if they're battling to recreate this chart. And you should, with the longest, longer time frames, you should look it into that. And before you reverse, you get that extremity to the downside, and now you've popped out the upside. Uh, so in my assessment, you should not engage the debt markets at all, unless, of course, you are a shorter. You should not be looking long. Yes, there might be occasional little rallies uh, in the bond markets and dips on the yields. Um, but overall, you could be looking at, at the under a counter trend trading to the macro. Whilst if you're done by the damn dip, every time uh, the bonds lost value, um, you would have killed it for 40 years. I think it's now that is a seminal reversal. Uh, mm -hmm. that occurred in uh, bonds. And that has a knock-on effect, of course, on currencies. And uh, I'm going to bring it to a topic that you, uh, you both love. Um, when we pivot out of this, it's very difficult to talk about bonds in isolation because it is essentially our money. It's the loaned into existence part of the money that is currency. When you look at the gold-silver ratio, just mark that March 2020. I'm going to now pivot you into the metals, which I know you both love. Um, when you go into the gold-silver ratios, it was also a seminal blow-off period for the gold-silver ratio. So again, remove that uh, overlay jaw, and you can see here it was, March 2020, on the same time frame. So that was a blow-off of under-appreciation of precious metals. So if you're at the end of a 40-year bond cycle, I see it almost as Cheech and Chong. Yeah, um, you're, if you're, you were long by the dips. This was the financialization of everything, the search for yield error. You bought the dip on bonds. It, they would always cut. This Fed was always going to provide more liquidity. And now people don't realize that we've had a structural, technical, macro trend change. And that is very positive for gold, and it is very bad for borrowed into existence money, which has debt and currency as its T ledger accounting. So that's the simplest way I can say it. But if you get on the right side of the macro as technicians uh, and as traders full stop, you tend to just get a bunch luckier, even when your entries aren't perfect, rather than um, feeling you're always paddling upstream. Uh, and that's the big key thing. So there's no longs for bonds for me at all. And the music, I also want to say, I don't think you're going to get a perfect symmetry in terms of how it reverses. In You had 40 years of grinding higher. So markets grind up, guys, as you're aware. I've, uh, I'm not teaching. You guys know this as well as I do. They grind up. But when they come down, they take the elevator. Uh, so they take the escalator up and the elevator down. Um, and uh, I assess that it will uh, there will be a reset moment which could suddenly very disorderly and they'll actually stop the music. Uh, and that's going to be, well, clock stop, retail guys won't be able to get a trade on. You'll be locked wherever you sit. You'll be sitting, you know, that's your dance partner and that's the chair you're sitting on. And if you got it, if you got one and the, those courts with their pants down or, or with their pants down. Um, so debt is not the market to engage in. And I think they unwind what this 40-year building of leverage far faster than the 40-year it took to put on. In other words, it could get very disorderly and then there's going to be an earthquake uh, and that's a reset moment. Uh, and uh, that's that's a big, big um, scenario that I'm calling. And that dovetails into why I was talking about a rate spike, which coincides with it in the, the opening statement uh, that I provided. In other words, true inflation has not really ever come into anything. It's the BLS stats, which are a manufactured lie, like uh, the worst of statistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people will be flushed out of assets. You know, uh, ma the mass affluent, you know, those with a small commercial property a a empire uh, or a buy to let mortgage guy with 10 or 12 properties, et cetera, et cetera. They'll wash them all out. It'll all be Black Rocks, Vanguard, State Street stuff. Uh, who will have a bottomless overdraft of cheap credit, one of the few people who will have that pipe into the system in the name of saving, you know, the asset class. Uh, and I think uh, that's our destiny uh, in terms of that. So positioning for that gold is uh, one of our favorites. And we talk about this somewhat a cranky head and shoulder uh, like mm. that. We have a 65 <laughs> over there. And then we have this big blow off top as a head. And this is a broadening structure. Uh, ah. And we say the break of that 
we'll see us visit down to the 65. We'll probably get some form of bounce and reaction at 65 before making that head and shoulder down to 32s. I do actually think it overshoots. And this is, again, the spike. So technical targets can be overshot, um, especially on head and shoulders, which are cyclical uh, major, on big time frames particularly, cyclical major structural events. So this is the world in Francis's eyes. This is uh, the 32. So I, <laughs> I like to say, and I've done this. Your <laughs> so, uh, say again, sorry, Kevin, I missed that. Is, that. is the armpit a technical term? I've not come across that before. <laughs> yes, well, we have to re we we have to introduce our own lexicon for being very specific. I actually right. go so far as uh, to say, become Jeffrey Drama, shrink wrap that head. So the, first, <laughs> uh, you, the last interaction with the neckline and the very first where it reengages, because you often get a lot of complexity in the hole in the shoulders, and it's the key level of significance that has been so uh, significant through you know a lot of error points here. 65, 65, 65, 65. Uh, and all of this period, I think, I think you know, it was 2016 that they really went into hyper overvaluation of bond market to support. You had the Shanghai Accord going into 16. China was hit the red limit on its indebtedness. It truly uh, created heat and built buildings while the rest of the world economy was in the toilet from 08, 09 to 16. Um, and since then, we've been in real global hyper overvaluation. And of course, now we have the central bankers buying the gold um, and they are deep pocket guys. They're not as active in the silver markets and not officially anyway, in terms of, you know, I don't want to get into the, the fraud and COMEX and all of that. But in terms of uh, their uh, their own ownership of gold, they are distributing debt. And the more the de-dollarization theme has changed, that is the death knell to that 40-year bull market in treasuries, uh, particularly, which drove actually bull markets in debt globally, who've all now been synchronized to become lepers in the leper colony with the same uh, over-indebtedness uh, structure. Uh, the other thing that's interesting that I think people are watching is the unique situation of Japan. If, if you want it, so you've got an audience You'll have gold traders. I've got a gold trade to show you, actually. We'll come back to it. It's on a shorter time frame. But while we were talking debt markets, Japan it doesn't have the exorbitant privilege of base currency uh, of the world, albeit um, eroding away for the dollar. Um, they have very high debts. I think it's anywhere between 280 and 300% to GDP. And you have yield curve control in full force there. So if we're talking debt markets, it's a very interesting market to um, also bear in mind. So if we go to the USD JPY, I expect the yen of the majors to be the worst performer generally. Uh, and that shows up actually when you look at the gold yen, funnily enough, rather well. Uh, but if you take a look at uh, the Japanese debt markets, boy, oh boy, um, when you're doing yield curve control, you now got to remember the Americans are at, let me just delog that, the Americans are at, you know, 3.9 on the 30 year and much higher, they went above six on short time, you've got the Japanese at 0.42. Um, and they are not wanting to allow that to get worse. So they've got so much debt, so many housewives that have bought because it's the woman that takes the net income and they do the safe thing for the last 30 years of investing in government-based uh, debt. So you've had a natural domestic bid on um, yen that you've got a terrible demographic. So they're dying and they're not giving birth to enough kids. They've got second worst to Korea, South Korea. Um, and what you, that effectively means is we have a bull call on the Nikkei on a mm. devaluing yen because the Nikkei has a lot of exporters that will be earning currencies apart from the yen, which we expect to be greatly devaluing. So if you can do CFDs or options on the Nikkei, we think uh, Merin Sabadwe, who has been calling for new highs on the Nikkei since uh, 1999, is going to finally get a wish. Um, and this, again, is a log scale, but major inverted head and shoulder of huge significance. And in fact, you've got a macro call on the yen here that will shock you guys. I've got a 57,000 target. Not, again, we're looking at monthly targets. Uh, so this is not tomorrow. This is not next week. It's not this year. Um, but you're going to see chronic devaluation in the yen. So we'll also visit the currency. 
Uh, and what that does is obviously own, corporations that only sell domestically aren't going to get as much benefit, but things like Sony that will still be earning other currencies that might be more backed by commodities and not doing as badly will actually get a stipend. And you have a, a hyper undervalued equity market relative on the export, the big major exporters, in our opinion, which is going to make up the Nikkei a great deal. So the highs that everybody remembers was 38,957, and that came in 89. And they've not got anywhere close there since. This is a 30,000 key level of significance. And we've gone into the second month with a close above 30,000, by the way. And the last time that happened, I'm highlighting here on this chart, um, was in 90. So 33 years ago. No, I'm not a Freemason. It just turns out that way. It's mathematics. Um, it's it's quite significant that 33 years ago was the last time you had a monthly close above the 30,000. The neckline for our inverted head and shoulders, I've got at 20, uh, and it's done on our log scale. So a big, long uh, left shoulder, a big, clumsy head up to the 20,000, then again a dip. That was a break, a continuation broadening structure during the volatility of March 2020 and all the events around that. Since then, a coiling up and a triggering and break of the 30, all the way looking for 57. So let me let you respond to that, Kevin. Well, it's funny you talk about that because I somebody, I, I think I saw Sven Henrik, like this big uh, uh, chart trader. He put the, he said, oh, all time high is Nikkei. But I said, okay, now measure it in gold expressed in Japanese yen. So Nikkei 225 divided by XAU JPY. Then it links back to what you said. They're depreciating so much your currency that gold reflects the destruction of purchasing power in the yen. And if you divide that by XAU JPY, you'll see, um, oh, you're, you're in the crypto. Uh, there you go. Cause yeah, let me get that. Yeah. And I think ice has the most data or for, I'm not, I always forget, but look at that. It's nowhere yeah, close. It's a chronic underperformer, yeah. And yes, it's underperformer. not doing They've good. They've not had the tech boom that America's had. In fact, European equity markets are pretty poor when you do that as well. British, um, I think, Kevin, you might be uh, still uh, in the UK. I'm not sure. I don't want to geolocate you beyond that. If, uh, but uh, the British, I mean, I went in 1999 to the UK and Tony Blair was bragging about the stock market and it was 6,921 or whatever it is. I think it's about 7,374 today. That was in 99, 23. You got basically quarter of a century and I think you've picked up a few hundred points in a point where the pound at one point pre uh, sub subprime was 211 to the dollar and is now in the 125, 130 range uh, today. So that's another chronic. If you were UK FTSE uh, companies, uh, it's no wonder every now and then, you know, the America dip in and buy a Cadbury's or something big brand name. So, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, and that, I love the fact that you're so quick for a cross analysis. So it can afford to go up because it's hyper undervalued, um, particularly on their exporters, even though we're probably going to get a crushed consumer. Um, you know, you think of Komatsu, Fujitsu, Honda, um, you know, they're in everything. Uh, we've got, we've actually got HVF setups on a lot of them. We discuss them in our community. It's an entire meme, a trading mining vein of gold that we're, we're on about. Because what you can do is you can CFD or option trade that and you don't get the exposure of the yen deval. You just get that accelerated upside of um, the, the, the actual Nikkei count. Um, obviously, if you personally invested, you'd have to buy yen and then go and buy the shares. You're going to get the devaluation in yen. Uh, and you want to, you can circumvent that if you're doing synthetic uh, uh, options on markets, et cetera. But I promised the gold euro. So let's just talk about that yes. one. We think that one's coming off and it's a shorter time frame one. The people watching this can go and still get in this one and can say thanks to you guys for giving a trade of the day for the moment. And inside of that, uh, as I say, we're reasonably optimistic. It's got a good chance of performing. Um, and uh, let's just also remind everybody of the gold euro overall macro before we drop into the lower time frame. This was a big structure that saw us be very bullish metals. During the oil bear call, we were. It's what's lesser known and people forget is that while we look for single digits on um, oil, we were net long gold. Uh, and we said, this is the perfect commodities trade. And that was a gold versus oil a chart cross thing, which I think you guys literally are the only mm -hmm. people that throw anything out 
similar. Uh, and this was just a clear cut run, a nice little falling wedge there, clear cut run from our funnel all the way up to that target. This is where you can use leverage because even with the events of March 2020 mm -hmm. on the monthly timeframes, providing you're not over leveraged, you know, you're too, you're putting down 50% and you're doubling your position size or maybe going two and a half, possibly three, uh, and you've got a super tight stop and it immediately moves in your favor. You're mostly up, up to this level. Since then, we've been in this grinding rising wedge, which I'm highlighting uh, here. And we think we're going to visit this top end of this wedge here. You've had one push out the top two, and I think uh, you're going for another little one. We, we're expecting... 1931 euros so let's drop to the time frame just to remind uh everyone uh where that trade is and how it looks so that's the one hourly we clear that up maybe just go to the two first to get everybody uh maybe we squeeze the four in in fact bunch that up a little bit this has been in a bit of a consolidation uh recently but the move into it has been up like that and we topped out here this is essentially again structural squeezes complex a lot of volume here uh accumulation bit of a, an argy bargy going on there and there was a bit similar over there so there's quite clear around the 1800 to 1810 mark real accumulation taking place so if i just go a fatter cokey in a different color here it's our assessment that that's a very strong ledge 1800 to 1810 um, and you've got a little bit of compression of the volatility so we call these volatility events rather than um, um, two trends competing against each other traditional technical analysis draws the two line like this and says which one wins out we say this is invariably a, an upside move into this this is a consolidation with a volatility compression that's a lower low than that high However, that's a higher high than that low. That is actually a squeeze, which is a volatility-induced constriction, which allows you, and we were advising entries uh, here at the 1820s uh, during this period. Uh, so we're slightly in the money, uh, but the target on that, if we pull that through, is 1931. So it's a decent little uh, risk-reward around 7.83 uh for those uh watching and that's that's a short term you got to you got to still pay the rent while you're waiting for all of these big boys that we are waiting you know years two years out to come in and uh that's why i like to mix that up in there and that that will be a nice little trot if you're risking a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars you know you know you'll get you'll get close to an 8x on uh that little move and there may be a degree of outperformance this points to euro also underperforming dollar because we don't have the same clear cut not every broker it offers uh, a, a, a euro. We use, um, we've got simple effects and SCM. Um, we've got links in our YouTubes if guys are battling to find that particular pair. Um, but some of them only offer against the dollar. Uh, and people like that. Uh, Patrick, I, uh, I think, you know, they really want you just to see the dollar, which is another reason why the dollar dies on strength and has mm -hmm. a super spike because gold is the canary in the mine. But if we only ever talk the dollar price and they use the dollar as the wrecking ball to crush all the emergings and the other currencies, not enough people are actually looking like you, Patrick, at the gold uh, yen uh, or the gold euro uh, or the gold anything else. Uh, and they would see they would see far more uh, of the canary tweeting in terms of uh, in terms of that. I mean, the gold yen. Again, another consolidation. Wow. I, I would expect that to give you a good upside. I just think the euro this time is the slightly better one. But if you look this, at it on is, the, this is this is where what you're talking about is is a weight of evidence analysis. So looking at it, you know, just from one the point of view of one currency, gives you a very one dimensional view of things. And it's a little bit like you know what we're talking about ratio charts. If you just look at you know one particular aspect, it's a very one dimensional view. But if you you take a, a weight of evidence view and you look at all of the ratio charts and you price your asset in gold or, or, or the ratio chart against inflation or the ratio chart against silver with that asset, whether it's cryptocurrencies or precious metals or, or the stock market, you have to have a weight of evidence. If you don't look at the full picture, you're drawing your conclusions on one piece of evidence. And what about all the other pieces of evidence? And it's the same with what you're saying here with gold. When you look at it in multiple currencies, you start to get signals from all of these other currencies that help to build a picture about the general strength of the market the general strength of gold itself and it kind of 
helps to filter out currency fluctuations. And it gives you greater conviction because yeah. we all have biases. You have to stress test your hypothesis. So we have a hunch, okay, gold is strong. Okay, but is it strong against everything? Is there something else that's stronger? You've got to test its strength against many things. If you're building a plane and you're in a lab and you're doing materials, metallurgy, and you want to know, you know, for a fighter plane, what's this metal? They test it against all other components. Um, they mix other metals with various other things to see if it has greater, you know, heat or, or stress uh, capabilities. You've got to do the same scientific endeavor. You've got to continue to test your biases. And when you look at this um, against the yen, I mean, up move, set up mm. for a great squeeze, up move, set up for a great squeeze. And the, what I love about this is the targets give you the next consolidation. So this is investment in gold, but it also gives you uh, moderate leverage trading opportunities with targets that you take all the way along um, that get you out just before the consolidations. You should be long the yen, and we've just had it go here. Now, I will argue when we drop into this little piece of time, I'm on the two weekly, the fortnightly chart here, you will see that if the euro is going up, it's very unlikely that the yen is in two. So if we go back down to the smaller times and have a look back at that. You can see this thing is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, it's almost like the Turkish lira. Um, I, was, I was about to mention the Turkish lira, Charles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. Talk about, talk about bottom left to top right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, but the, the euro one right now is better. And you get, we always trade the best pattern. So there might be some specific euro malaise that comes back into um, focus on uh, that side. Uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit on the metals and debt markets. Um, we've been, it's, it, we know we want to talk where we're accurate. Where we've been less accurate so far is energies. So let's address that. Um, our primary energy play is oil markets, and Patrick did ask around that. Um, so here we go, uh, weekly. And let's just grab that chart, fella. I still assess and still think that we are going to face some degree of demand destroying event. It's just a case. It seems it's been that that event has been quite closely managed and synchronized. Mm -hmm. We've had two OPEC cuts now in here. There was the gap. It was our opinion that that gap would be close to the downside and that it, at some point you're going to create some structure for a downside break that brings this entire broadening structure, big head, into there and then shoulder uh, into a, a macro head and shoulder. We don't see this as the same scale because of this hyper stagflation. And people get this wrong. They think they think we're bearish commodities now. Generally, we're not. We're we're in the hyper stagflation macro fra fundamental framing. What will intervene, however, is major retail consumer demand destruction will short term potentially give dips mm. for people to get long commodities for the macro again lower down. So we are saying trade the commodities long macro. Generally, just be careful right now where it's still reliant on the retail consumer. Nobody cuts uh, production twice um, if they're selling every barrel they're making at a good price. That is a price management strategy. Um, and this is why we like this particular one. It shows up a little better against the Western nations generally, which I treat as the Dixie. So if we go, whoops, let's stay with USD, WTI, and I'm just going to divide that by a dollar index. It tidies the structure up a tiny bit more. Um, and, and we maintain that that's still on. Um, there we go. And I'm going to put my eye back on so you can see the annotations I've done. They don't overwhelm too much. Uh, there you go. So overall, it's our assessment that this is going to be soft. As we said at round about here, um, it was round about 76. It, it started to fall and then it's, it got the production cuts and it went higher than our entry. So I was in the red on a, a uranium short, Uroy, which we can talk about as well, um, and on my oil. I've actually kept that oil and it's back in the money. But we are going slightly up for slightly up for now. But this is a messy right shoulder conumbation. This 70, 0 0.7. So that's remember, this is 104-ish, the dollar index divided into oil. That's why you're getting roughly 0 0.7, which is around the low 70s, 71 to 73 is a critical area. And I would watch for any downside. If I drop the time frame now into this. I would watch for the possibility of 
consumer destruction and any downside. We had a grind line in there. We expected it to skid. It's now made a low there. This has failed to run the previous low, and this sets up classic structure again for downside breaks. Quite volatile. Three lows in a row, and here you sit over here. Well, you could come down. You could go maybe up. But if you come down here again and you bounce, and then you're waiting and you go very low vol, you've got to worry about this as technical structure. Inside of what we have as a head and shoulder and letting go of the 70 uh, handle. Don't forget, we supposedly got a war on. We've got a war on, a hot war. I mean, you know, Twitter, you can find videos of people getting shocked by drones and all sorts of crazy stuff, very dark. We've got a war on and oil is battling to hold the $70 handle. That should tell you about the strength of the economy in true sense, not the Fed's red hot labor market narrative um, that they keep doing. That's to give them the license to maintain a hawkish stance, having run late on the inflation they created on the last cycle. Uh, so that's our that's our framing um, on that. Uh, uranium, let's just go past uraniums. I want to cover the places where so far we haven't been accurate, which we might have mentioned on our last uh, visit to you in fullness uh, as well. So uranium, we are talking about uh, energies again. Uh, we chose one particular, this was our best pattern uh, on the uranium trade. And it was you, Roy, uh, it was uh, uranium royalties. And technically, that was the one we found to be um, the best set up. But I will say, uh, for example, I think Sprott had a little bit of a bounce. You've seen rallies here on, um, I'm pretty sure for you, no, it's not uh, Sprott, sorry, my apologies, it's energy fuels. You've had, you've had some uh, rallies. I think we were discussing last time with you that there would be a break here. So you haven't made great progress, but there's still that threat of reversal sitting in there. And sometimes you can gestate on, on, on an area and wind up for a while and then let go. So this is still a scenario that we think has a chance of happening. Lower highs over here as part and parcel of a larger potential reversal. Hasn't happened yet. I think it's going to be associated with a big drop in demand. Maybe new lockdowns could do something like that. I hope not. hope to be wrong on that one. But there could be a number of reasons that could bring about uh, that degree. The, let me just find the one we're still in and was my primary uh, short trade uh, of a uranium related uh Roy. and as i as i mentioned so far no fireworks not being a star on that one yet it has broken though it has broken so this one's head and shoulder has broken but it's in a rally period right now so we are short uh from the 219s uh over here that's a right shoulder and it's been drifting down now, you'll see there's quite a mess of lines here, and I suggested you could even break into this trade. And if we take it into the four hourly, you had a little structure here that was breaking down. And this is where you've had a sudden spike recently on uranium that invalidated that small uh, yeah. structure. So that trade idea there is a failure to break into this trade. But we're in from up top here. And there's been a counter trend push. Didn't make the smaller strategies uh, target, but you sometimes get that. So you're getting a longer rally period uh, in that. So um, for now, those, you know, sometimes people get a bit personally peed off if they're uranium bulls. And there was a great just, period. Just, just one, one, one thing just to sort of mention in this, uh, the, the price, the spot price of uranium, the metal um, continues to... Uh, been very very strong doesn't it it's not showing these sorts of breakdown patterns um so it's in interesting looking at uh ux1 um sort of with this as a backdrop i can see exactly what you're sort of demonstrating and saying here but there, there's a little bit of a mismatch with the metal itself which oh, is interesting. a disconnect you, yes you we're know. trading the equity not the commodity it's important yeah. to highlight that yes. thank you yeah, because a lot of people are saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And we're going, well, actually, I'm short from 2.30. And it, it's not it's not a ripper yet, but I'm yeah. quite comfortable technically with the position. Yes, um, yeah. So there is a divergence. 
Yes, because yeah. you know, Kevin, the, the, the miners, they don't track the price of the metal. They track the performance of the metal versus, let's say, the U.S. equities. Like that, yeah. if you would zoom out, that chart would probably look like uh, gold uh, divided by SPX or something like that, you know? That's what it would look yeah. like, that chart. So until yeah. the commodity, like the, these, look, the exception to in the uranium space, the exception is Cameco. Because if we would chart Cameco, I'd love to have your take on Cameco, oh, actually, yeah. Francis. Because that yes, one's, uh, happy to that one's have different. a look at anything you got. And I'll remind you, I've got plenty of time, but I'll remind you, I've got an interesting uh, crypto to share with you and okay. uh, a view there. Cameco. Let's do Cameco, Kevin. And then let's close up with uh, the, the crypto, uh, Francis's yeah, take the, on the crypto. The ticker is CCJ. CCJ is the ticker. CCJ. Yeah. That's like a, a flagship. Uh, I think on the oh. yeah New York Stock Exchange, that's fine. It's because it has a lot of data that one, and you you really get to see that two thousand bull run. Yes, and and a lot of them have come off amazing bull runs uh, as well. So let's go. Whoops, I had it up and I took it out. I don't know why I did that. Uh, there we go. So structurally, it's entirely different. This is entirely yes. different, and in fact, you've lead you've laid out. So it's again, it's not a universal trade. It's not a universal trade. This particular equity clearly is structurally entirely different. And you can argue that you are you are in something like that, and you've already had some form of technical breakout uh, to the upside on on this. Uh, and you know you've been in a good trend uh, that I would argue you're squaring up out of. We call the squaring up. So you reached a technical level that you're consolidating around, quite possibly thirty to the high side, and you submerge. We call it iceberging, where you sort of got a very strong technical level that you can't hold, like the thirty. So you have a, a tiny bit above the waterline and a tiny bit below the waterline. There's your little iceberging effect and then adjust the technical run. And now you're grinding and you're wanting to get above that, grinding up, grinding up, and you've had a technical break. You've got a tiny bit of a shooting star on the weekly. You could revisit that technical line, maybe just break it to the downside before maybe slowly building and continuing to go. You don't really want to break that grind line, but this looks like an upside and it doesn't have any of the ominousness of you, Roy, which is in a head and shoulders and is actually bleeding to the downside and is battling to find a bid. So you are get you. It's quite a divergent mixed bag. And the only thing, as I say, is any demand destroying event, which there's great risk as they continue to crush your consumer, uh, could have knock on effects. But I think you'll see it worse in oil first. So you know, flights being reduced, um, fifteen minute lock, city lockdowns, green, whatever, anything like that coming in, or just excessive uh, interest rate pressure that sees less travel, less uh, that's going to knock through oil and then it can have con a, a slight contagion effect through uh, this category. But there's no arguing that uh, uranium's had a great run. And if you were in from 540 up to 26, and it, on this stock, it would be my expectation that you continue to the upside at some point as well, mm -hmm. if you're not already breaking. So it's a totally different technical perspective. And it's quite a mixed bag. And I think some people get it wrong. They get a, they get uh, a little bit triggered when you say you're short something in the uranium field. Yes. Uh, and they go, oh, you're wrecked and we're going to win and all of this. They get a little bit emotional. Um, th this is this is looking great. And it's clearly a mixed bag uh, on the energies. It's not a it's not a one uh, no. one view that fits all. Uh, and as you mentioned, the actual underlying is doing great. I also mentioned there's a big blow off. Uh, I, we, we our view on crypto. So you'll have some uh, part of your audience that are quite yes. uh, crypto centric. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, I want to reiterate, despite the the recent events, so there was a Gainsler event that uh, came up. I think, let me, is this him? No, 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 hold on, where is he? I might have shut the article. There it is. There, there's the character um, of the SEC. He called 12 token securities. So he's actively now starting to name. So our big position is they've had, I don't know how many years that this guy's been at the head, but they've had, a, even before he was made head, I think that was already three, four years ago. They've had an immense amount of time just to define what's a security, what's a currency or a commodity, uh, et cetera. And essentially in all these years, they've literally not come up with anything until now we're starting to see a couple of them now being picked out as one thing. And it seems like Bitcoin and ETH have been singled out for a free pass. But the, from Ripple down, uh, and it's it's interesting because if you look at the scale, Bitcoin, the top two are good. 
you've got to take out the stable coins. They're not part of this. So number three is, of course, Tether, which is classic of a post bear market where everybody's cuddled up in Tether. So you start with Binance, then you've got another stable coin in USDC. You've got Binance. Ripple, you know there's a legal case. So they've gone for Cardano um, and Solana. Uh, who else did they mention? Um, just let's get that in. Matic and Ada. So it seems most of the top 10 um, are in there. Decentraland, Algorand. Now, Algorand is a status token, in our opinion. We know they are working actively with central banks. And we have a, cent a status token meme. You want to choose the best technically uh, significant status token. And that brings me to the technicals that I'm going to bring you to uh, and where we see a major move. Uh, so why status coin? What about, so this is a very jaundiced eye view of the crypto industry, but you're not getting privacy. You're not getting freedom. You're getting, you're getting um, open source banking uh, where anybody can blockchain search your movements. Uh, there is no privacy coming out of this. There was a lot of ideology, liberty and get Bitcoin. It's your you know, your own, you can be your own central bank and you can be private. There is no privacy. It's quite clear that something like Monero, for example, is falling and skidding. It's, I think it's at 26 now. It used to be about 15. It's been slipping. They don't value privacy. There's very little discussed about personal privacy in this new CBDC rev revolution. In fact, it's more about control, preventing you from buying certain things. It's anything but privacy. It's control. It's domination by an intermediate force which is a central banking cartel. So our view is accept the inevitable instead of trying to make uh, an honest libertarian market out of something that's clearly captured and say, just make the money on the upside. Um, and you should have structures. You should have territorial jurisdiction. I'm looking at the Panama Canal here from the penthouse. I can see the boats coming on. It's territorial tax system. You, that's how you, you know, you hold on to your hard work uh, and earned. Uh, you use the weapons they use, foundations and various other things. So if I just go to the uh, crypto tokens, the one we like that I'm going to be showing you, um, th there is another one that I'm afraid I'm just keeping under wraps a little longer, but we may do a public release, but is Ripple. So Ripple is, in our opinion... In a, and this is was helped, by the way, by the SEC. The fundamentals created this pattern structure because Ripple failed to make a new high during the last bull market. So the Bitcoin bull, bull market, I maybe jumped mm -hmm. to the gun a bit. I should just give a short statement on Bitcoin first and come back to this Ripple chart. Sorry. So uh, for us, crypto has turned. So let's just start at the beginning. You go global macro, you come top down. The God market is uh, Bitcoin. Crypto has turned, but some will not quite acknowledge that uh, fact just yet. Um, you've had a lengthy bear market. In actual fact, we feel this was the top against the NASDAQ and against gold. People were already de-risking during the 69. That was an echo bull that made a marginally higher high. We had amazing targets that got made on this uh, Bitcoin. We're, we are continuation trading, but actually you have a bookmark of two head and shoulders uh, that has actually defined uh, the, the the last cycle very, very beautifully. So let me just bring it a three day, uh, it's about half a week into uh, play, it's a busy chart. Um, but in essence, this was head and shoulder city. Um, for example, that was our first one that, whoops, that's a bit too fat. <laughs> that's, <Cokey>, huge... <laughs> that's what she that's said. The proverbial child spat cokey. That one was beautiful, um, and it took you to the lows of the falling wedge, which you bounced off and went up. That's what got you your 69 high. However, that threw down a level, which is where you're at now that you touched recently. I'll remove all these lines in a second, um, but I want to show you these head and shoulders. Uh, so that's that. Then the seminal head and shoulders was uh, this. There was actually a smaller monarch in there. We call it a monarch. It's the king. It's the smaller one that starts them all falling. But there was that one that was seminal. And that structure gave you the low. Done. So that was your starting end of bull, head and shoulder. That was confirmed on that flag break there. And that was, uh, this is a 42 and a half neckline. That is a um, 47 and a half. 
So we've got some interesting key levels of significance over there. And that is your downside uh, move ended there. That is beautiful. Now you have this 30K, 25K, my apologies. You have your new left, your new head, and a very strong break out of this right shoulder that then almost straight away started to grind. And where did it hit into? Legacy targets to the downside. So I'm going to messy chart. I'm going to take you into the lower time frames. Um, and let me occasionally just take it off so that you can see that price behavior. So this is pretty much a, a stable pullback that is typical of continuation. And it's also a potential revisit close to, if not fully, I still think you might have a chance of dipping back to the 25. In the same way, you got this throwback over here on the head and shoulder that was there. That was this one. So it's quite natural when you have head and shoulders to get uh, throwbacks uh, to it. But this was all just a big flag and you were in bear season. And then the news came and that was another flag. So in our assessment, you reversed here with some momentum. Key levels must be broken with momentum. And we were calling bear here. We said, don't trust this rising wedge to 25K. There was more to come. So on those, we were pretty accurate. And we, we think we still are accurate in spite of this pullback. When you cease to go back significantly on bearish news, it is actually a bull, bullish marker. And this recent FUD with large amounts of major cryptos, all named as securities, actually, fundamentally, is quite a terrible thing. Because securities law now means registration, FCA gets involved, everybody gets involved, capital gains tax, it's like you spec all the things that everybody wants to escape. The IRS get their mitts into, you know, you made some money once, two, three years ago here, there on that token, et cetera, et cetera. These are all securities now, et cetera. So this for us is the early stage, but it's not parabolic bull. It is recovery bull in much the same way as you had back um, in to you had this long period after the low where you were squeezing yeah a long period now we just have a different structure we have an inverted head and shoulder uh yeah so you were at your lows in 2019 but you only really broke clearly that people would say it looks like you might be reversing and some people said that you weren't clearly a bull until you're taken out that structure to the downside so you know there's a lot of people not recognizing that we've turned and i put bitcoin in the anti-fiat category uh for now and gold isn't the, the god market of anti-fiat and that's clearly also in a bull market so that's the overall take just on uh bitcoin i can give those that just want something a smaller slightly smaller time frame uh, that's such a busy one. I'm going to choose a different jaw. Sorry, that gets so well drawn up on the when we're doing micro analysis. It's kind of a, we we kind of had a falling wedge that we asked the question, "Have you broken out of?" And now it's turned more from a falling wedge more into a channel. I would imagine. So I might adjust that jaw a little bit um, and make it more of a channel. And but the the red line goes where we expect the next break and move. So something like that. Uh, and that, as I said, make him red. So we expect that to go to the upside and you dipped a little bit out the bottom. So we would probably say, you know, here's your basing structure along for Bitcoin, something like that. And that would be a gray line. Um, and there's your split up. We like to put a halfway mark and a, and a, a tactical continuation pattern type price behavior grinding 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 revisit to 25 which will normally see you trade 24 8 or 24 7 perfectly remains possible so you could get a small bid after the gains there maybe only make the halfway mark have a final capitulation bounce go around but the next major level where you move significantly is this line again to the upside but again, nothing too fireworksy because you've got a little bit of dollar strength as well out there. And people forget that there's a dollar analysis in all of this. So taking it back to Ripple, we actually, as we head our way to Ripple, we highlight that F is outperforming Bitcoin. So those that are Bitcoin maxis won't like this message, but F is clearly outperforming. And we see it going uh, to uh, 0.11. 
uh, from about 0.07. So this is another case of, in point where it's doing that and then this. And this is all a three impulse falling wedge, one impulse, two, three, and walking out the cap line. So if you're a big Bitcoin maxi, you could do better by holding Ethereum. But now we're working down and we're going to say, but, 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 if you're going to do that, you may as well go also for the one that we see probably eventually is going to come. And it missed the it missed making a high. So now I'm back where I started with the ripple. Uh, and this is what I wanted to show you. Um, and that's the history of XRP. So this is a very lengthy history. It Normally, when you're not in log scale, this is what that chart looks like. Uh, so when you've got pumper mentals and uh, huge time frames or for crypto long time frames, you get crazy charts. So log scale makes sense to us. This was an unbelievable squeeze, which led to an, a very powerful run. You would have taken some profits here. You would have got back in here and you would have run and taken some more profits there and you would have had a blow off. We have an overperformance methodology where we leave part of the trade on. I'm not getting into the lows and highs of that, but this was a very good period to be super bull uh, ripple. It literally was its best. Uh, so then you had the down dip. You eventually supported on that legacy target. And this is the failure. This is the 69K Bitcoin era where this was the 20K Bitcoin era. And XRP didn't do it a new high. And amazingly, on a longer time frame, this makes this structure more bullish to us for actually having relative weakness at a particular era. Why? Because it sets up the same pattern again. Whilst if you're looking at Bitcoin, you made a, you 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 know your your relative would be up there somewhere. Uh, you made a higher high by some way. Remember again, this is a log scale chart. So this is a macro squeeze here. And as we always point out, you have three major impulses: very volatile, and then slowly they calm. That's the one that calms. The third normally calms. And this is what we call a relative low two zone. So you are essentially, by our reckoning, sitting with XRP. And people are going to hate you for mentioning this token because everyone's turned into, oh, they're the banker token. We must hate. We must hate. They're all surveillance coins. They're all watching you. Nobody is working for you. If you want uptake and they want their products to succeed, they're going to cooperate with government. So there's a lot of emotion trapped in this. It's not going to be popular segment this. But if you talk about what people stand to gain, these two areas feel samey for me. That means you might have a slightly higher drift up at some point here. And then again, you might come off a little bit and then you're going to run. So the question then becomes, what's the target and how far do you are you going to run on this? And we see through 16.77, potentially 17 and a half. It's a bit hard to finalize that because we haven't finished the pattern. So from where we project, we're having to aggregate and guess. But that is huge uh, on a log scale, and that would represent 33 times. And we have had multiple examples many times. It's not the first time we've thrown out a ridiculous number in the crypto markets on log scale based patterns of macro structure. So but there's no guarantees. But the status tokens are going to be utilized for the CBDC. I assess fundamentally. Technically, I am seeing this in an accumulation setup at a low to you could dollar cost average for a year in here. And then you could have gone up and over and be somewhere here, lightly in profit and about ready to start the journey of a lifetime with an average entry of around 50 cents going to, uh, you know, 16 and a half uh, or 33 times, maybe 17 and a half, uh, depending on how we finalize the final draw. And that's in dollars. So that is huge, huge, huge. If you can average uh, 50 cents. And even if you're accumulating all the way up here and down, you can have an average of 60 cents uh, or 65 cents and be through uh, $17. You're going to be looking very, very nicely at this. And this for the real big, big return. But it's important to note, the bigger the pattern, the longer the time frame. Don't forget, this sat here, the gestation period is are lengthy. This sat from 2013 and broke 17. You know, that started, it's before 14. The good news is the first and second impulses is where all the time is built up. The third is far more subtle. 
and you tend to be very close to the entry point. You already have your first. That's the 17 high. That's your failure, but your 19, uh, 21 boom market, but your failure to make a new high. And you've already had an extended period with a slight lower volatility, upward tilting grind. That's probably going to lead to a minor move up. Uh, I say minor, you could touch a dollar and get over it. It might have a little bit of positive inclination on the SEC case, which could be a driver, but that capped that period here immensely. So you almost have trapped momentum that still has to be unpacked from the previous bull market. In short, XRP relative to say Bitcoin or Ethereum has done terribly on its failure and it may have catch up, which will give you the overperformance. So not having had the underperformance as a hodler through these desert years, you can show up for the party, which will be bigger than everybody else's party. Um, and there's only one that I know that we feel is going to throw out bigger than that. So that's a that's a trade suggestion and the technical justification for it uh, over there. I don't know if you want oh. to ask the questions. That was Just a great showcase, uh, Francis. You can ask you, you know two, what I two like? questions. Sorry, go on, go on, Pat, go on. Just before Kevin uh, chimes in there, I, I love that you you have your own fun terminology to help crystallize these moves. And a lot of people, they they have a hard time with TA because they it's it's either trend line, but they don't put like, oh, the iceberg. Uh, that crystallizes. Okay, that's that's what I'm seeing here. And then you, you get to re-see that easier and easier. Mm -hmm. So that's a great tip for, for anybody trading. Put some funny words. Oh, that's a sneaky ninja, like behind the tree peekaboo, like stuff. Because these patterns repeat over and over and over. They're like drawings, right? I guess you kind of these are drawings that are get repainted by market participants on all time frames and throughout all the instruments. Man, these, these things, they it's not astrology for men, guys. This this stuff really happens over and over again. That's all Absolutely. I had to say about that. And if you want an example of iceberging, the most significant round number for XRP that it's not stayed above for any material period is the one dollar mark. Mm. And you had you did actually get to $3 in the super spike. The, the log scale masks that. You're up at $3.30 up top here. But if you look at it in terms of a month, you have one candle on the up and one on the down, and then you're back below the one. So that's really, a, it was a super spike, but it's, it didn't hang. It didn't have any hang time. It was a cheeky little uh, a dab and go. It was a jab, jab, and then it was run. Um, so And you had a, a similar event here. So that's iceberging on the one. And this is all a, a, a big technical wind-up structure that you can participate just at the explosive event, the New Year's party, um, that has been in gestation since 17 till today. This is larger than this structure over here, the other one. It has been in gestation since 2017. So this was the end of 13 and broke 17. You're talking about all of 14, 15, 16, and just the beginning of 17. So it was about a three-year pattern. You can jump in on something that's been, we're 23, we're halfway through 23, that end that started December 17. So it's all of 18. So it's from December 17 to mid 23. You've got a five year uh, structure, you know, going on by the time it breaks. And you'll know this, both of you as technicians, the bigger the pattern, the bigger the move. So you, mm -hmm. want to, you want to look for smaller time frame fractals where you can put risk management on for your leverage trades, but keep it very small. And you want to generally be in a big investment base in this. So I'm a net accumulator of XRP. Uh, and, you know, I'm holding my nose if I, while I'm doing it. But you know what? You have to hold your nose. The military industrial complex is flying at the moment when all other consumer equities are crashing. Uh, and we all know who they are. Do you want to make the profit or not? Uh, or do you want to moralize? Uh, sometimes you just got to take the money and look after yourself. And that's what you do with it that you try buy your best freedom with. Uh, but that's a massive move. Uh, and it's and it's all about the one dollar. It's all about can we break and get substantially through the one dollar that it goes from being the major resistance of 17, the major resistance of 21, not once, but twice, and eventually becomes a huge support as you move chronically through it. By the way, you never came back to the six cents and the nine cents levels here, but the target served as support. You'll see again here, supporting on the target, supporting. We've got another wind up there that got you back in and again, supporting on the target at the worst point here. 
So I don't think once you break and you get to 16 that you ever see one again in the same way you're not seeing uh, a nine-tenths of a cent. But I do. you could come back down to $4 in a bear market maybe. Who knows? It depends how chronic these things will be. Uh, but if we are to squeeze the entire derivative system, the entire failing debt system into a CBD system, even if people are capped at $10,000 a person, uh, depending on your country, nation, euros, pounds, whatever, which it does look like they will initially in the initial lifeboat that goes out during the earthquake event, that's going to be a lot of XRP if it's running on those rails uh, that are going to be needed. And Lumen is uh, the alternative. So one in four nations, if the others take XRP, they'll probably take Lumen. And Lumen's a li little behind, but similar structure. Also failed uh, to do it, uh, but just not as liquid and not as advanced. So I personally would suggest to guys um, that the XRP for now is, is the better one, but you'll see there's very clear similarities uh, in here. Let me just take my scribbles and sketches off for now. Very clear similarities as well and likely to have a similar move, but just a bit heavier and lower. So your first mover in HVF method theory, parlance, is your best mover. The last bull market, ADA was very, very early to run from about four cents before Bitcoin, before the others. It was one of the biggest movers. So stay with your best pattern and go with the first movers that are more advanced and more ready. And I think the legal case might come into this. And on XRP dominance, how do you cross vet your XRP analysis? I just want to show you something else that's really interesting on this case. The XRP uh, dominance. So this is essentially the, the total market cap divided into XRP. And it's about 2.5% uh, today. So if I just draw uh, this uh, and bring you into more recent times weekly, we have upside structure on dominance as well. Again, so technically it's making sense you are looking at some of the same things but you've been forced to look at it in a different way the market cap of everybody else do you still feel bullish this is the thing the hypothesis is scientific can i disprove my hypothesis you must always be critical of your bull bias on something how do i how many other ways can i look at this or bring other things into it um and again a double w bottom there and let's again get the fat koki Let's do some quick tech. Sorry for that. Just get fat cokey up so that everyone can see that and draw with a straight lines. Let's go blue. It'll show up better. So you've got, again, a very key round number of dominance there, 3%. That was very high. So you had a big W at the 3%. Again, iceberging at the 3%. There you go. Little wick above it. There you go. And a kiss. So in the same way you icebergged on the dollar, you've got this big structure that is setting up. Very strong on the upside, very long and slow on the down leg. Strong on the upside, long and slow on the down leg. You're now setting up. This could already be a break of the third. We talk of three impulses always. The break of the third impulse is critical. You're coming up here for breaking um, this impulse. And the geometry on that dominance that takes you to 6% and the W bottom that we highlighted here, which is the visit to three all the way back down to one, another key level, that takes you to eight. That's a massive flip in dominance for something that's at two and a half now and that we've been accumulating at 2% dominance. It goes to eight. You're talking about four times more significant to everybody else. And that could be in a bull market where the others are getting fatter and bigger by market cap. So you're talking about a two and a half percent overgrowth in, in, in the crypto market could go up 30 or 40 percent. Generally, most of it could be in the majors. I think I think you're going to have a boo. Remember, everything in, in the tech boom, all the big heroes were status, Amazon, Google, all of them. You've got to apply the learnings of history to today. Make the money. If you'd been in Apple, Google, yeah, you know, uh, Cisco, the uh, Amazon, not pets.com, not boo.com, because it was new and it was a business plan with a cool kid with a cool haircut. Get the status, make the money. And this, these are the status tokens. Uh, and that's my positioning. And the dominance seems to support that as well. A chronic relative overperformance from uh, XRP. 
that, <laughs> that's uh, I mean some incredible chart work there. And I've just whilst you've been talking there, I've been looking at um Bitcoin versus silver and XRP versus silver. Put the chart out on Twitter today showing the um the chart for Bitcoin versus silver having broken down and not looking great. But um interestingly, the chart of uh, XRP versus silver um looks pretty pretty good actually. Um so that's an, an interesting point there. And just a question I just wanted to ask you is um overall, are you um sort of bullish for US stock markets, the S&P, for example, because obviously um cryptos have been quite closely tied to to tech stocks over the years, particularly you know so the Nasdaq certainly. Uh, it's so a good wondered, question. Wondered, it's one I'm the most fed into that, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the most ones I'm the most lukewarm on. Uh, I, uh, in fact, there's, uh, there was a guy uh, called Hunter, not related, who was pushing the stock market for a melt up just after it was my express view it had had a melt up and we were in head and shoulders on indices. And yeah. I contradicted him uh, because he was he was fairly belligerent. Um, and as I say, I just thought he needed taking down a, a little bit, <laughs> showing up on every single uh, show. And I actually thought he was going to do a lot of damage to retail. And we were in head and shoulders in our view. Uh, and this it was in and around here in February on this right high uh, that he was saying, you're about to go 50 to 60% up in four to six months. <coughs> and we said, you're in a right shoulder potentially and you're about to turn down and our target is 358. And that's what played out. He was putting people in long. What's happened is he stayed a bull long mm all this way through and now mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying he's right a he's not right yet because the point at which he pulled long was there and you could have bought you could have bought in here if you had taken our warning the head and shoulders performed what hasn't happened is the head and shoulder hasn't cyclically continued to the downside um and you have finally got above the neckline in june and he was talking about this in march uh and february of 2022 that's when he was first doing it and he's just continued with it throughout the, the throughout being wrong for about that's, that's called that's called persistence forecasting in the trade yes yes a year a year <laughs> and nine months <laughs> now, yeah. now the, the good thing about equities is if you throw upside targets you just have to keep repeating them because eventually you will be right in an inflationary environment even exactly. if you say Dow 35, 40,000, 60,000, eventually you are going to be right if you're persistent enough and then you can claim to be, have been accurate. But the point of the matter is had you bought in there, you're still deeply in the red yeah. to where we are now. But it is showing technical strength. Now, the other thing is there's a real rotation in here. Retail and small and medium. If you look at the Russell instead of the macro, it's a different, it's a different image. It is going up again, but it's a different image. Um, you've got this structure. Is that going to be an upside? I've currently drawn it as a downside the last time I came in here. If that turns into an upside, all of them will be going up. So the equity market could be quite bullish. It could be quite bullish. It doesn't make Hunter right. He was wrong when he started his case. But in time, it could be reasonably bullish. But a lot of it, I think, is based on Fed policy. And if you get a June no cut, no hike, people will start calling peak rates, which is, takes us back to where we started um, with the debt markets. And they'll go, oh, peak rates, the yen will stop getting weak for a bit because now the dollar is going to come down and all of this, 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 and they do a pause and all of those feign them, feign them. And it's a trap, in my opinion. I treat that with suspicion because they're right-sizing down the food supply chain. You're cutting down oil production to try to retain price. This is all inflationary. You're killing demand, yet all these price management tools are coming that are right-sizing to the downside, the supply chain, so that the pricing remains high. This is a perfect criteria for hyper-stagflation. Stagflation was the 70s. Hyper-stagflation is far worse when you're far more indebted. So overall, he was uh, wrong on the Russell. If you, you know, March 22, you're still way down. So all these equity indices, but they are showing times of turning and this could be an upside break. There's also that rotation. Um, you've got the AI meme, which has seen major, major, if you eliminate the Magnificent Seven 
from the stock market you you actually go this quarter so far you go from a phenomenal performance to a negative performance mm. so very there's cool. a lot of rotation and that's very narrow and you guys will know about breadth indicators as technicians so it's a lot on the ai and again it's status to me this is all essentially military industrial complex we've had the pharmaceutical industrial complex have its day and now we're pivoting back to the surveillance finance which is part of the military industrial complex. You're just the 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 the, the person they're waging the war on. Um, it's it's statist, uh, and as I say, there's a lot of rotation. You could have oil stocks going down on demand destruction because uh, everybody, in spite of a war, um, and you could actually have AI mooning. I think this AI has only just started. I think that can moon. So it, you could be both bullish and bearish and i think there's a lot of cash on the sidelines so i think there's scope for s p to be bullish but i don't trade fundamentals i need to see a really good uh index uh in a really good pattern and and at the moment if we just look at the spy that looks like a rising wedge i'll take off all my legacy analysis on there uh and the overlay jaw and just say you're squeezing higher on a rising wedge that's not typically wh where i want to be you're popping out of a rising wedge, but it does look higher. The, the question is, where's your stop placement? How far do you go? You've got a localized high coming up here. I would not be an entry, but there's I think there's a lot of cash on the sidelines and you will squeeze potentially higher. Is it tradable? Is it investable? Probably not for me. Probably not for me, but I, I would expect likely higher until that demand destroying event happens, if it happens. Um, the VIX is totally benign. There's, everybody's super relaxed. So you're going long in an environment where you're at record lows again for the VIX since the last time you were this low was just before the events of March 2020. So that's not a time to go low for me. That's peak complacency. So everything uh, that I've seen here, you know, you can see it. I mean, you guys have taken me to this through your very good question. And, I, you know, I'm showing it to you. That's your VIX. This is, it's lower than that point. The last time it was that low was pre-COVID. Can it go lower? I probably expect it would, but you're getting in late into this journey, in my opinion. Um, would, you, would I chase into NVIDIA? I absolutely wouldn't because it's run a lot. Where's your technical stop? How much further do you go? That's gambling. These become memes and people feel they left out and it's FOMO. There's much better, the accumulate on XRP, for example, is huge. And for a short-term trade, the gold euro um, for an eight, almost eight hours. These are things you should fill yourself up with. Where's my stop? Where's my target? Where's my entry? That's it. That's a game. Uh, and that's my managed loss. Everything else is gambling. And so equities, I think, higher, but I'd rather be in the Japanese. I'll show you something, one of the Japanese stocks. This is Nintendo. We're waiting for a down leg on this guy. We're waiting for a down leg on this guy. They sell largely international. And you've got a you've got a yield curve control in this country. That's going to what takes the pressure. If you control the bond and the yield, the currency gets killed. It's quite simple. You don't you can't make it go away. If you you know, if the water's building up against the dam, if you don't open the sluice gate, the dam wall breaks. <laughs> You know, there was a flood upstream. You've got to do something. You've got to let it out. Otherwise, the pressure gets too big. So the currency goes down. Currency goes down in yen. This goes up a whole bunch. And it's earning dollars, pounds, Swiss francs, selling games to kids, et cetera, et cetera. I'm waiting for this thing to give me my final down leg. And then you're long. Same for Honda. There's a lot. And we're doing this deep dive in there. Do I want to chase Nintendo? Uh, I mean, my apologies, NVIDIA, uh, right now. Uh, no. Where's the stop? Tesla's gone from, you know, almost 100. And we warned about that. And now it's back up at 220. 2.2 times. I think it's overvalued, but it's probably going to go a bit higher. It was pro probably very overvalued there too. So there's no key trades. It's got to be a technical trade. But, I, you know, I think higher, yes, I wouldn't want to be involved in it. The military industrial complex, very strong. We're in, um, this is British uh, BAE, which is a defense. And this is where I say most very, things are stateless. Yeah. This is very, very strong. We've been waiting for a pullback and it just ran away. I don't think I'd get into this now.
It's just almost done too much, but it's in a macro upside HVF, a huge one. I put my drawback on there. We've called from 33, and I'm damned I missed it because it actually did a beautiful return move and just kissed our funnel to 86. But you could get in at 47 and get to 86. This is a military industrial complex uh, thing. These are your industry memes. And AI is a weaponization against citizenry, I think. Yes, it will help you with your marketing and budgets and you'll have two robots talk to each other that will entertain you and lots of other things as well. But um, yeah, that's where I stand. Sure. That was that was say, awesome, man. That's a mastery course in uh, technical analysis. Oh. There. I hope everyone watching this has you know got some some tips mm. and starting to sort of see how you know we can analyze the charts and get useful information out of them. Because it's not just a case. I know some people will be wanting you know to just be told you know buy this, sell this, buy now, sell now. But I think a lot of our listeners here will also be looking to pull up their own charts on uh, on, on trading view and so on and do their own analysis. So, you know, really do appreciate that you've gone through that in, in a lot of detail for us, Francis. So really appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. No, enjoyed and love talking charts with you guys. True technicians throwing out some awesome stuff yourself, by the way. Let me reiterate that. I follow you on Twitter um, to see the, the cross, very creative uh, across many things. And they always well annotated, beautifully drawn so nice to just talk to some real, uh, real technical people with who are taking the time to do the work properly. Uh, so well done to you guys. Yeah, appreciate well, that. Thanks, thanks, thanks. It'd be it'd be fun if you'd be close because we could talk charts because I have nobody to talk charts like in person around my house. And uh, your sense of humor seems great, Francis. So seriously, man, I think we'd have a great time uh, out of the bar or whatever, you know, it'd be awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, love, I love it. Uh, and it's the truth. You know, charts are truth. It's what the money does. It's the footprints right. in the sand. It gets you in the trade before the news. And this is yes. the key. It yes. is the fundamentals, but it's the fundamentals that you haven't yet heard. That's right. Um, and that's that's what I love about it. And that gives you the chance to get in really early, uh, not, not the first, but really early with tight stops and grab expansive moves. And right. hunt volatility funnel method, which is our technical approach that I've given small alludance to, here is what we help people learn and uh, teach, and you can they, they can engage from the market sniper.com. But we learn, grow, and we implement and practically trade it across time frames. And our most exciting are the macros because then you can drop down time frames and get lots of fractals at lower levels where you can trade shorter terms that end up tri triggering the medium time frames that then trigger the macros. And that's where you can get ridiculous R's in terms of risk to reward ratio. Uh, and the game, that's your game. How how tightly can you manage that loss and how big a gain can you get? And on that 33X, uh, I didn't throw out any RRR numbers, but if you can accumulate at 50 and you've got a stop on that uh, ripple chart, I don't, I'm not, let me, I never, I'm not sure I actually covered that, but, uh, and if you've got the time, but I should, you could, you could get the risk reward very low uh, on that baby. I'm going to put the log scale back on there. You know, uh, I would actually say after the strong move here, you wouldn't you wouldn't look for that to trade below 34. Uh, what was the low? 35 cents. You put a stop at 34.99 and you accumulated 51 and 40. I put a 49. I just want to buy as much below 50 cents. And of course, gains that did me a major service because he just crashed the market back down. It's now back at 51. So it's great. Remember, limit orders are your friends. Entries matter when it comes to your RRR's uh, calculations. For all those listening to two great technical uh, guys running a podcast, they will tell you this as well. Limit orders. The, there's time for this. You can accumulate. Keep building big stacks under here. This points to clever accumulation to me. And you could probably say, if I wanted to be a bit more aggressive, I'm on the monthly, you could probably go a stop even below the 41 on this little hammer because i don't see you easily falling below that it might be a bit aggressive you might prefer it there that you know cut your choice the other game is you start with your stop there and then once it's moved away you can tighten a little bit and you can buy more reason and i will use also conservative leverage but not yet i'm just accumulate a big base put it as collateral on your bitfinex your binance whatever and then i'll probably double the size as we get to the key triggering event 
maybe two and a half tops and let it run. And then I close 75% at the, the target. And then we over performance manage. We have tools for that as well, part of our program. Uh, and we leave it off. But by then you should be laughing. And and let's just do that risk reward because that's why we're here. Um, and we put that back on. So if I just did this, this is what's potentially available to you guys. Uh, it's a long position. Let's say you net accumulate on the bear news. Whoops, why has that got such a... Is it some large? You, you have to scroll. You have to. Yeah, you, you have That's to scroll. That's a deep up. stop. <laughs> I'll give you a trick. Uh, hold hold the, the middle of the, the drawing. You don't have to play oh. for a chart. Just uh, reset your chart. Hold hold the middle line in between the two circles, and then drag it up until the bottom zooms back into. Um, uh, okay, let me let that, me listen to Patrick. You're better yeah, here, and just no hold hold your drawing and move your drawing upwards. Yes, okay. hold the click and drag. Yeah, move the drawing upwards. Ah, uh, there you go. go. Well done. Yeah, you're spot on. It, it's Thank something you. with the log scale there. It, it yeah, just, it does. It's it's up. Up. <laughs> it gets a little bit freaked out, doesn't it? It's quite interesting. So if you were to go there and Jesus. this, it's a, this, it's massive. That's what she said. Seriously, that's a, a sixty to one, seventy to one, a hundred to one. <laughs> <laughs> Right, sis. and that that, that, that's that the holy always grail. gets me interested. That always gets me interested. I love it's. It seems Supreme. almost too greedy. Like I've never seen a hundred to one pan out. That's that's crazy stuff, man. <laughs> well, watch this. Uh, two and a half years. I would say by then you should have already be well done. Begun the break. You could already be finished, and this could start Jesus. in nine months or eighteen months or sooner. So I mean, you guys will still be around. I'll still be around. Wow. Uh, we can talk again on that, and that's on the deeper stop there. So this should all just be an accumulation zone. 100 to 1. I've been quite high. I've got limits. I bought, as I say, 49 on this. Uh, so, you know, 100, you could, if you were pushing it, you could potentially beat that and get 120. What's this? This is around up well, to the top. Even if even if you bought on the final breakout, so your, your, your upper red line, and even if you bought at over a dollar, you might be able to still anchor... You might get a swing low right below that line before it breaks out. You might be able to get a very similar risk to reward, even if you bought a dollar ten. Yeah. Oh, then you'll get opportunities on the smaller time frames. This is yes. what we specialize in, in as a community. Because what actually happens is we're sitting on the mountaintop here, looking down uh, on the macro. As you drop into this on the lower time frames, there's plenty of scope for other little fractures, uh, other little fractals to form. Um, you know, you could, this could do this, for example, uh, go up and over and down and set up a three like this. And, and you could be accumulating and then that stop is coming here. You know, it's coming right up here and you yeah, can say, well, this interesting, pattern interesting. won't break and we'll just be a net buyer as it comes on the relative lows here at 47 and we'll be a stop at 39 or 40. And move say we the, um, can you can you move the entry point up to a dollar just out of interest? Move yeah. the entry point to a dollar, and uh, just have the stop loss maybe um, I don't know five cents below that or something. Just assuming there's a swing low just before the breakout. So uh, ninety five cents. Yeah, and the and the entry point just above your red line. Well, that's yeah. tight. That's a very tight risk reward. That's too uh, tight. And, and yeah, go back you, out you, move the, the um, you move the entry point just above the red line. So you want him to buy at a dollar five or something like that? Well, buy, buy at a dollar five. And that the point the point there is just to show that you could actually wait for and lower it until you get a risk reward to a hundred. See about the equivalent or ninety to one or a hundred to one. So even look hundred to one. That's hundred and one. You could buy at 103. The gray number is 103. Yes. That's a clear break. It's three cents through the 100. You could have an 87 stop. Yeah. Uh, and you could run it to these levels and you're going right. to be so, at so the, the point of that is if you if you kind of don't trust this and you're thinking, well, you know, I'd rather wait for a bit more really strong evidence and wait for the break through that red line, then you could do that and you could actually still achieve really, really good. A hundred level. Yeah. A hundred level uh, of ours. Um, but yeah. yeah, indeed. And you can wait for that $1, which I highlighted as your water mark. That's the reason we yeah. do our key levels at blue. We talk about house yeah. working 
it's the watermark. So you've, you've icebergged above it just a few times. You haven't been able to hold for any significant period. This is now a high momentum break. Typically how you overcome really dominant resistance levels that you only spike through and can't hold is with momentum. So you move strongly through them for an extended period, but you're never seeing them again. Uh, and that's that's pumpamentals. This is this stuff. So to highlight, if you miss, you only were in this trade from this one, one month, two months, three months, and you're done less than a cent, anywhere from half a cent right the way through uh, 16 cents, just getting to here. Then you were getting back in on another one. But let's just say that's stage one. So 16 cents from half a cent, you've already, you, you can see that that's uh, 32 times. You've done this before. You know, it's not like it's impossible. It's not a guarantee. There's no guarantees in trading, but you've done this before. Then you got back in at 22 cents and you ran it up to 81 cents. You've done another 4X on top of that. And that's still leaving no overperformance calculation, which we have all the way up to $3.3. That's getting out sub a dollar. So there is uh, there's a, there's a lot of potential gravy in this trade, and I thought this would be something your community would like to hear. Yes. This is what we spend our time about. How do you grow big R's? And then don't forget, just for your pay the rent check at the end of the month, your gold uh, euro, um, which is still uh, I feel good chance of getting. Look out for that 1931. Let's stay in Twitter touch and see if that one lands. I give it, uh, you know, it should start its move in the next few days. Not as sexy, uh, but you should have your long-termers of great interest, but not as sexy. But if that comes in, you you know, most people aren't getting six. Most people aren't getting six R's plus. Most people think they're getting two. And when you look at their P&L statements and assess, they're snatching profits and they're actually getting 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. That's my finding. Is when you do P&L analysis on people, they don't stick to their targets. They get nervous when it pulls back at the second interim year. It has a pullback because it's resting and then they snatch a profit and they let a loss run. Exactly the opposite. So adherence to process, profits run, tight losses, quickly taken losses. Usually when I'm wrong, I'm out very quickly. And you can have two or three entries even where you've given up one unit of loss, well, but then you're this, taking it. This, yeah, this is something we've mentioned many, many times is that you can actually have 70% of your trades as losers, 30% of them as winners, and still be doubling, tripling, or quadrupling your portfolio in a relatively short period of time. You don't need to. You don't even need to have more than fifty percent of your trades as winners. If you are, if you have a tight stop loss, um, you're taking a tiny, tiny hit, maybe a 0.25 percent now fit, whatever, whatever it happens to be. And then when you're letting your winners run and the you know, trade is working for you rather than against you, you can end up with these 10, 15, 20 time trades, whatever you know, whatever the risk to reward ratio is. And you can have one trade that kind of covers more than covers all of your losses for the entire year. So it's so important that people understand how to how to use the risk and money management tools on the, on the trading platform. Absolutely, great comments. Hey, all right, Francis, man, this is this was excellent. Again, just remind everybody where they they could find all your your cool stuff. Sure, only engage from our website, themarketsniper.com. Uh, but you can also, for if you just want to check us out, go to YouTube, follow the Market Sniper. I also do the Crypto Sniper, a separate channel for crypto. Um, and yeah, uh, enjoy the free content that's available there. Book a call. We don't have salespeople. It's members of our community that on board that have been with us for many, many years. It's a community of the willing. We see a reset coming. We prepare also for that. Um, and we think everyone should, but we want to build wealth. Uh, if we're to be slaves, we want to be rich ones uh, and we want to have lots of space and freedom around us uh, to enjoy our life. So it's a lifestyle trader. It's not 14 hours on nine screens. I'm sitting here on a laptop only, actually, uh, and I travel around uh, and it does all I need. You don't have to be nine screens and always on. It'll break your back. It'll break your eyes. It'll break everything. Uh, and that's our approach. Lifestyle trading, uh, high R's with HVF method. Thanks for having me on, guys. Beautiful. I really appreciate your time. I uh, always have fun having you uh, on there, uh, Francis. Awesome. Thanks, Francis.